to. All right. Uh, the, uh, let me just remind you that last time we were talking about the dynamics of molecules. And uh, the, uh, I think at the end of the hour, we came to the conclusion that if the molecular vibrational state is, uh, is in its ground state, it's just roughly a harmonic oscillator down at the bottom of the well, to the extent that the bottom of the well can be approximated by a parabola. There's a harmonic oscillator approximation there. Uh, this approximation is obviously only valid when the uh, quantum numbers are small. When, the, when you're near the bottom of the well, when you get higher up, it's going to be uh, uh, less, less accurate. But uh, to, re to uh, repeat, uh, we came to the conclusion at the end of the hour last time that the measure of the width of this wave packet, uh, it's a Gaussian wave packet naturally for the ground state, is of the order of magnitude of about uh, what I call delta R here, is of the order of magnitude of the uh, mass ratio, the m over mu, to the one quarter power multiplied times the uh, characteristic uh, uh, length of the system, which is the Bohr radius. And the equilibrium length is also the same order as the Bohr radius, so this is, this is the same order as the equilibrium length bar zero. Uh, the mass ratio in question here is the ratio of the electron mass to the reduced mass of the diatomic molecule, mu. This reduced mass is the reduced mass of the two nuclei, and therefore it's a typical nuclear mass. In the case of carbon dioxide, uh, the number turns out to be very roughly about 10 to the minus 4. And this same number very roughly applies to most diatomic molecules. It's a small parameter problem. So in particular, raising this to the one quarter power, we get 1 tenth. And we come to the conclusion that the vibrational amplitude of the diatomic molecule as it vibrates is roughly about 10% of the bond length. That's as a, as a rough work, uh, estimate. And as a result, the diatomic molecule, roughly speaking, does behave as a rigid rotor, which we started talking about uh, before we got into molecules. All right. Now, uh, by the way, uh, something else we concluded is that the frequency of vibrations, the call the omega B, is in the order of magnitude of the square root of the mass ratio, uh, to the one half power, the square root of the mass ratio times the typical frequency for electron motion, which I didn't put in here, but it's the characteristic of frequency of electron motion in hydrogen to the minus 10, uh, 2 times 10 to the minus, well, the inverse of this time is 2 times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Uh, and the vibrational period, as I say, is down by about a factor of 100, meaning that uh, the uh, photons emitted in, in the vibrational transitions are about 100 times less energetic than those which are emitted in electronic transitions. Electronic transitions correspond typically to uh, the visible light or ultraviolet range. And so infrared, uh, so the, uh, the vibrational transitions are in the uh, near to mid infrared. All right. Now, I think that covers the, some things that I said last in the last lecture. Now this picture that I've drawn here is actually only for the case where the angular momentum is equal to zero because I've just drawn the true potential and not included the centrifugal potential. Allow me now to include the centrifugal potential and we'll see what differences that makes. Centrifugal potential, of course, is strictly positive. It's, it's L times L plus one h bar squared over two mu r squared like this. That's, that's just what it is. Now, if we're near the vibrational ground state, then as I just explained, the range of vibrational motion is rather small, roughly small, compared to the, to the overall distance between the uh, two molecules. And if that's so, it's a reasonable approximation to replace the centrifugal potential just by its average value, or its value at the middle of the vibrational wave function. In other words, just to replace the R squared here by an R naught. Uh, it's reasonable to do that for the ground state vibrational wave functions. And if we do, the centrifugal potential just becomes a constant, which is added to the radial wave equation. Now that constant won't change the wave functions, it'll just change the energies. And it changes the energies by the addition of this constant. And so it now becomes possible to write down rather easily what the energies are. They're a function of both the vibrational quantum number in and the angular momentum. And there's, first of all, is the energy of the harmonic oscillator, n plus a half h bar omega v, which is the vibrational energy. 
plus this constant term for the centrifugal potential, L times L plus 1 h bar squared divided by uh, 2 u r naught squared. This is a very rough expression. It's rough, but it gives you a, gives you, does give you a pretty good idea qualitatively of what the molecular spectrum looks like. All right. Now, um, if the temperature is not too high, the vibrational motion will be in the ground state. For many molecules, this means ordinary room temperature for diatomics like oxygen and nitrogen and so on. And uh, if that's so, then the vibrational energy is just a constant. And if we're interested then in how the energy is dependent on angular momentum, it just comes from this, this uh, final term. It has an L dependence, of course. And in fact, what you see is, is that it's really the energy, it's rotational energy of the rigid rotor. We recover our rigid rotor results. The reason this is that mu times r naught squared is the moment of inertia of the rigid rotor. So the molecule does, to this extent, does, does behave like a rigid rotor. And we, re, we re, recover the results, earlier results we guessed at uh, uh, regarding a rigid rotor. Uh, what about the energy scales of the rotational degrees of freedom? Uh, they go as a quadratic function of L, the uh, angular momentum quantum number. If we take just the lowest one, L equals 0 and L equals 1, let's just take those two, and we look at the number L times L plus 1, and then you get 1 times 0 is 0, and then you get 2 times 1 is, is 2. Those are the numbers that appear up here. So allow me to write delta E uh, ROT for the, let's say, the uh, difference in the two rotational energy levels between L equals 0 and L equals 1. Uh, if we do, then this is 2 times uh, <coughs> for the LL plus 1, 2 h bar squared divided by uh, 2 mu r naught squared. And if we want to estimate this as an order of magnitude, we'll care about the 2s, and for the r naught, we'll replace it by a naught squared, because as an order of magnitude, that's what that is. Now, this must be proportional to the energy k naught, which is the characteristic energy of electronic transitions. If you just do the algebra, what you'll find is this is k naught multiplied times the uh, times the mass ratio, the mass of the electron divided by the reduced mass of the diatomic. Uh, and uh, so this is a factor of about 10 to the minus 4. What that means is is that the typical uh, energy scale for for uh, transitions of, of rotational degrees of freedom is down by another factor of 100 compared to the vibrational energies which in turn are down by a factor of 100 compared to the electronic energies. So there's three energy scales in the molecule. There's the rotations, which are much less than the vibrational energy scales, which are much less than the electronic energy scales. And typically, they're about a factor of 100 each. This means uh, that the photons, which are emitted in corresponding transitions, have energies which are down by the are scaled by the same ratio. As a result, photons corresponding to rotational transitions in the molecule are down by about another factor of 100 compared to the vibrational energies. That puts them in the far infrared or into the microwave regime. Uh, or to put this another way, if I write an energy, try to create an energy diagram, an energy level diagram, if we say here's zero, and we start off with the uh, vibrational energy levels, that's basically harmonic oscillator theory. So the first one is at 1 half h bar omega b, and the next one is at 3 halves h bar omega b, like this. Uh, these are the uh, these are the vibrational energies. But now if we have the rotational energies on top of them, it, it produces a fine structure of, of levels like this that sit on top of that. It's purely additive, you see, in which the, the scale length here, the little delta energies, is about 100 times smaller than the separation between the vibrational. And so this is a typical, what they call, row vibrational spectrum of the molecule. All right. Well, I think this is all I want to say about molecules. If you take a chemistry course, you'll learn a lot more about them. But this is the, these are the basic facts about them, uh, and uh, they're probably important to know. Um, the, um, the now what I'd like to do is to turn to the uh, hydrogen atom uh, as the next example of the central force potential. Uh, the potential here is uh, V of R. Uh, let's uh, put in a nuclear charge Z so it becomes minus. Z e squared over R, it's a Coulomb potential. Uh, this, is in, uh, this includes not only uh, ordinary hydrogen, but it also includes other uh, single electron atoms, such as singly ionized helium, uh, doubly ionized lithium, all the way out to uh, uranium, which is 91 times ionized. And the corresponding Z values here are 1, 2, 3, uh, up to 92, or more if you want. 
Actually, in recent years, there's been some experimental interest in highly stripped uh, uranium uh, and other heavy atoms uh, for a test of quantum electrodynamics when the electric fields are strong. Uh, so there's actually some interest in such uh, single electron atoms like this. This would be called hydrogen-like uranium is how it would be, how it would be described. Generally, these are hydrogen-like atoms, that is to say, single electron atoms. Now, if we write down the Schrodinger equation, and I'll write this down in the, the radial Schrodinger equation in the second version I presented in the previous lecture, it's going to be uh, minus h bar squared over 2 mu. Mm. Mu is the reduced mass here, uh, d squared f b r squared. And then for the effective potential, there's l times l plus 1 h bar squared over 2 mu r squared for the centrifugal potential minus z squared over r for the true potential multiplying f is in energy times f. This is the uh, radial Schrodinger equation. Um, the, um, in its uh, second version here, the f of r. The mu that appears here is the reduced mass of the electron nucleus system. Um, uh, one thing not to be confused about is the mu when they're talking about molecules was large compared to the electron mass of the order of about 10,000 times larger because it referred to the reduced mass of two nuclei, two atoms. Here in this context, the mu is the reduced mass of the electron plus a nucleus system. And when you have two masses, one of which is small and one is large, then the reduced mass is almost the same as the small one. So the result is the reduced mass here is very, to a very good approximation is the same thing as the electron not much difference. However, um, there is, we do have this ZE squared which appears here. Now, um, this equation, it has a lot of physical constants in it, in it and we can uh, get rid of them by introducing characteristic uh, uh, distances, energies, times, and so on, very much as we did above in the case of molecules. So if I start uh, with the distance, for example, let's call the distance scale A. This is a distance scale that can be created out of the physical constants in this equation. It's basically the same as the formula above. Remember, these, these characteristic uh, physical quantities came out of using just the three physical constants, which were E, M, and H, H bar for the electron. M is the mass of the electron. Uh, the only difference here is, is that instead of the electron mass, we're going to use a reduced mass, which doesn't change things very much. But maybe more importantly, instead of e or e squared, we're going to use z e squared. So to take to get our char characteristic uh, uh, quantities uh, in the context of hydrogen, we'll take those values up above, replace the electron mass m by mu, a very small change, and replace e squared by z e squared. So the a here, as you see from looking up above, becomes h bar squared divided by mu times z times e squared. And we can see that this is approximately the Bohr radius divided by z. So this is just some dimensional analysis. Uh, but it shows that in a hydrogen-like atom, that the effective Bohr radius, which I'll call A, as in contrast to the Bohr radius defined up above, is basically bounded by a factor of the nuclear charge. This makes physical sense as the nuclear charge increases, the positive charge is stronger and it pulls the electrons in closer. Uh, but this is in particular how it scales. It scales uh, inversely proportional with the charge. Likewise, if we go up to the energy, uh, we get an energy scale, which I'll call capital K. It differs from K naught up above, and then we replace M by mu. So we get mu, and then and E squared goes into, into Z, excuse me, E to the fourth, goes into Z squared E to the fourth, uh, divided by H bar squared. And this is very roughly the same thing as z squared times k naught. The only reason it's not exact is because I'm using the, the reduced mass for the electron instead of the, the exact mass. Um, but in any case, this shows you that the energies of transitions in electron, excuse me, hydrogen-like atoms uh, goes as the square of the nuclear charge. Uh, already in hydrogen, the 13.6 ionization energy corresponds to a, a photon in the ultraviolet uh, range of frequencies. And this goes up as k squared as you increase the nuclear charge. So for heavier atoms, we're talking x-rays, actually quite a way into the x-rays for heavy atoms. Uh, let me mention one more thing, which is the velocity that comes in. The, the velocity is called v here instead of v naught. It was e squared over h bar up there. This becomes z times e squared over h bar. This is the same thing as z alpha, z times the fine structure constant times the speed of light. 
And to take two cases, in the case of hydrogen, this is 1 over 137 times the speed of light, which means the velocity of the electron in hydrogen is, is uh, essentially non-relativistic. It's less than 1% the speed of light. But in the case of uranium, it's 92 over 137, which is about something like 0 0.6 times c, which is something like about 60% the speed of light. And so we see that the characteristic velocity of electrons in the ground state in an atom like uranium is substantially relativistic. And as a result, uh, the heavier atoms are not well approximated by the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. It's not really a very good first approximation to take for those heavy atoms. We'll do relativistic quantum mechanics in the second semester, but for now, uh, since we're sticking with the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, our results will apply mainly for the uh, atoms with, with not too large a value in C. All right. So this is just some dimensional analysis. Now, if we make a change of variables in our radial Schrodinger equation, let's say write R tilde is equal to R divided by this A, and let's say E tilde is equal to the energy divided by K, uh, then it has the, and, and substituting in here, it has the effect of getting rid of the physical constants. So we end up with an equation like this. It's minus a half uh, d squared half uh, of d r tilde squared. It's exactly the same structure. Uh, L times L plus 1 uh, divided by twice r tilde squared minus 1 over r tilde for the potential now is equal to e tilde times f. Yeah, it just, as you see, it just gets rid of the physical constants. Now, uh, to proceed with this equation, or either, either version of this equation, uh, it helps to get, before doing any math, to get some uh, qualitative idea of what the uh, energy levels will look like. Uh, we can do this just by looking at the potential energy curve. Let's take the potential energies. Uh, there's more than one, so I won't say which it is. Uh, if we take the true potential, this is the Coulomb potential, and it looks something like this. This is minus Z e squared over R. Potential goes to minus infinity as R goes to zero, and it goes to zero as R goes to infinity. If we take the centrifugal potential, it looks like this. This is L times L plus one h bar squared over T mu R squared. Uh, this goes to plus infinity as R goes to zero, and it goes to zero as R goes to infinity, kind of the opposite of the true, of the true potential. At small distances, the R squared diverges more rapidly than the R, and so the positive centrifugal potential dominates. So the true potential is, is positive at small radii. At large radii, both curves are going to zero, but the centrifugal potential goes to zero faster, so the negative true potential dominates at large radii. So the curve has to go negative. So somewhere it must go negative, and then it has to asymptote out to zero like that. Must, this is what the U of R curve, the effective potential has to look like. So in other words, it has a well like this. And this well will support bound states. And the result is from a diagram like this, you can see without much trouble that the hydrogen-like atoms will have uh, some number of, uh, of discrete bound states at negative energy. But you can also see that when the energy is positive, if there's any, any number, it can actually continue a positive energy. So you can send in a particle of some energy will bounce off this, this effective barrier and come back up. And so the spectrum uh, of the of the hydrogen atom, hydrogen-like atom, in a complex energy plane, which is where you draw spectra, is first of all, there's a continuous spectrum going from e equals zero out to e equals infinity. And then you've got some number of discrete states at negative energies like this. Actually, it turns out that there's an infinite number of bound states, and they accumulate like this. There's an accumulation point as the energy goes to zero. So a more accurate picture for the bound states is this dot here, and then a dot here, and then a dot here, and then an infinite number of dots accumulate of the origin, after which it just becomes a continuum. All right. OK, so this is the qualitative features of the hydrogen, hydrogen-like spectrum. Uh, in this course, we're mainly going to concentrate on the, uh, on the bound states. They're simpler mathematically. But it should, you should keep in mind that there are also these positive energy continuum states. And uh, in particular, if you want to have a, a resolution of the identity using hydrogen atom wave functions, you better include the continuum, because otherwise 
you don't get a you don't get the identity just by summing over the bound states. All right. Now, um, so in talking about the bound states, then um, it will help to uh, to do some further coordinate transformations on the already scaled Schrodinger equation there. Let's introduce a radial variable I'll call rho, and this is the convenient definition that it's too hard. Ah, no, before I do that, let me introduce something else. Uh, let's take the case where the energy is negative, so we're talking about the bound space, and let's define a quantity I'll call nu to be equal to 1 over the square root of minus 2 times e tilde. This is the scale of energy. Uh, you refer to my notes here. And uh, yes. And uh, let's also introduce a radial variable rho, which is defined as uh, as twice r tilde divided by nu. Uh, e is negative. E tilde is negative for the bound state, so nu is a positive number. Anyway, this is a convenient change of variables. And if you do this, then you get for the uh, radial equation d squared f d rho squared uh, plus uh, minus l times l plus 1 over rho squared. <coughs> Uh, plus nu over rho minus a quarter, actually on f equals zero, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the main reason this is convenient is it puts it into a uh, more or less standard form that you find in, in uh, books on special functions. Uh, in any case, uh, so when you apply standard techniques of differential equations to this, uh, to this equation, uh, in particular, to uh, look for solutions which are normalizable, so they vanish in infinity. What you find is the index nu here, which is effectively just a function of the energy. You find the index nu must be equal to an integer in order to get a normalizable solution. And so let me just call it n, replace it nu by n just to emphasize that this is an integer. You also find that this takes on the values l plus 1, l plus 2, and so on, all the way out to infinity. I'll remind you that the radial Schrodinger equation is parameterized by the uh, angular momentum quantum number L. So in effect, there's a different radial Schrodinger equation for each value of L. And the n here, which gives, which is a label of the, uh, is a label of the eigenfunctions, starts at L plus one and then goes on out. As far as the energy eigenvalues themselves are concerned, the e tildes depend only on this quantum number n, or n or minus one over two n squared. Or if you like, I'll take the tilde off. We'll multiply this by k, which is our up here is our characteristic uh, energy for the system. But they, they go as minus 1 over 2 n squared. As far as the wave functions themselves are concerned, they depend on n and l. And as a function of rho, they look like this. They're rho to the, get it right, rho to the l plus 1 power, uh, multiplied times e to the minus rho over 2, times uh, an associated with their polynomial. 2L plus 1 upstairs and E plus L downstairs on the row. And this is the associated with air polynomial. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, technical mathematics that's involved in, in uh, that's straightforward to, to setting up these results. I think in terms of what's useful to remember, it's useful to remember that you have this exponential factor here, minus rho over 2 if you follow back the definitions. This is, turns into e to the minus r divided by n times a. And the a is the effective Bohr radius, and n is the principal quantum number, which is then multiplied times a polynomial uh, in the radius r. It's worthwhile remembering that the, the hydrogen atom wave functions have that form. <coughs> All right. I didn't normalize this either. That's a further, further, uh, further calculation one needs to do. All right. <clears throat> now, um, as I keep saying, the radial Schrodinger equation is parameterized by L. Uh, the uh, effective potential, which is the sum of centrifugal and, and true potentials, is therefore different for each different value of L. Uh, for most uh, uh, central force problems, this means that the different radial Schrodinger equations that you get for different values of L effectively have different potentials that don't even know about one another. It's almost as if you're choosing random potentials for each different L. And as a result, the energy levels in the typical problem uh, for different values of L, there's no relation one to another. In particular, it's not likely there's a degeneracy. 
Uh, but what this does do is it motivates us to organize the energy levels both by the angular momentum quantum number as well as by this n quantum number. The n quantum number, by the way, is called the principal quantum number in the case of hydrogen. Just gives it a name. So let's make uh, a table in which we have L running across the top. Of course, the values are 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, up like this, 4. <coughs> Speaking of L values, there's some ancient terminology that has historical uh, meaning only, uh, in which these uh, different L values are given alphabetic letters. They go S, P, D, F, and then after that you go through the alphabet G, H, I, and I guess at some point you run into P and you have to skip it, but that doesn't happen uh, in real atoms. So um, anyway, this is the uh, this is this old terminology for describing the different angular momentum values. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately you just have to learn it if you want to be able to talk atomic physics. You have to know what those symbols mean. And then on this side, let's put the energy levels coming up and down. <laughs> and uh, as I explained, the energy levels are basically minus one over two n squared. Basically means multiplied by the, uh, the characteristic energy. So if I measure things in terms of the characteristic energy, then n equals one. And I didn't say this either, but this is where n runs from 1, 2, 3, and so on. That's the range of the principal quantum numbers. The ground state is at uh, n equals 1, which is at an energy of minus a half in terms of these units, capital K. And um, because n starts at L plus 1, if L is 0, n equals 1 is the first n state like this. Let's do the L equals 0 column here, the S waves. The next one up is most of the way to the top. This is at n equals 2, which is at minus a half times quarter of 2 squared. It's 3 quarters of the way up. Maybe it's not quite that far. So this is the n equals 2 level. And somewhere up above that, we've got n equals 3, which is at minus, minus a half of 1 over 3 squared, minus a, minus a 9, relatively speaking. And so you can see what happens is, is that these accumulate like this, and you get an infinite number of these. If we move on to the L equals 1 radial equation, the principal quantum number n starts with L plus 1, which is 2. So the first, in, the first level is right here. This is an n equals 2 level, and then you have n equals 3, 4, 5, and so on. If you go to the L equals 2 or d states, then the first n value is n equals 3, and they accumulate up like this. And here you start with n equals 4 and go on up. So these are the energy levels. Uh, organized both by the principal quantum number n as well as the angular momentum. This is a typical way of organizing energy levels in atomic physics and many other places as well, using these two, these two quantum numbers. This kind of a diagram, by the way, is, especially if you draw on the transitions, is called a Grotrian diagram, is a name for it. Now, the levels that are shown here uh, are, are given designations that, that indicate uh, both the principal quantum number as well as the angular momentum. So for example, this one is called the 1s. That means n equals 1, and s means l equals 0. This is the 2s, this is the 3s, and so on up. This level is called the 2p. That means n equals 2 and l equals 1. Here is the 3d. Here is the uh, 4f so on. Here is the 3p, uh, here is the 4p, and so on. The levels are, are labeled like that. I'm calling these levels, but actually what they represent are uh, pairs of quantum numbers n and l. There is another quantum number in the wave function, which is the magnetic quantum number. This enters because the total wave function in three-dimensional space depends on all three quantum numbers, psi, n, l, m. It's equal to the radial wave function. I'll remind you the radial wave function is that this f is equal to r times capital R. So it's the radial wave function is a function of n and l of r times the y of m, which depends on theta and phi, giving you the angular dependence. And in particular, the magnetic quantum number appears when you talk about the angular dependence. The energy doesn't depend on the magnetic quantum number because the energy is independent of orientation. And the result is, is that the different L levels are 2L plus 1 fold degenerate. And if I make those numbers running across here, that becomes 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. Those are the, those are the, the that's the order, order of degeneracy of the levels that are, that are drawn here. 2S, for example, is non-degenerate. 2P has got a three-fold degeneracy. 3D has got a 
bifold and sew it across like this. Now, um, I mentioned this several times that the different radial Schrodinger equations have different effective potentials. For most problem, those di problems, those different effective potentials means that the spectra of those radial wave equations don't talk to them, they don't know about them. That means most likely the levels in one of these columns is not going to coincide with the levels in any of the other columns. And thus, there's, there tends to be, for a randomly chosen radial potential, there tends to be no degeneracy amongst these different columns. What I want to point out is, is that that's not the case for the Coulomb potential, for the, for the hydrogen atom or Coulomb potential, because in fact we have exact degeneracy running across. That's because the energy levels depend on the principal quantum number n, but they do not depend on the angular momentum quantum number. Um, and this is not this is not generic. Uh, I guess I've erased now my uh, my uh, uh, my molecule uh, energy levels, but they did depend on both n and l. There was a harmonic oscillator part, which was n plus a half h bar omega. That's the omega v. That's the vibrational part. And then there's the then there's the L times L plus 1 h bar squared over twice the moment of inertia. That's the angular part. And so the molecules, the molecule shows you what is what is typical for, for central force problems. The energy depends on both those quantum numbers. But to go back to the case of hydrogen, there's something very special about hydrogen that it does not. It only depends on N and not L. Well, um, one question is, why is this so? Why is, why is this true for hydrogen? The reason is that hydrogen has extra symmetry that goes beyond the rotational invariance of the, of the system. If we had no degeneracies amongst these different columns, which is a typical case, then the only degeneracy you would see would be the degeneracy from the magnetic quantum numbers, which is due to rotational invariance. That's the, would be the 2L plus 1 fold degeneracy. That's what you get. That's what you get for any system that's rotationally invariant. But hydrogen has extra degeneracy. Degeneracy of energy levels in quantum mechanics corresponds to symmetry. I can't go into this in too much detail, but it's a fact. And the fact that hydrogen has extra degeneracy beyond what's expected on the basis of rotational invariance alone means that the hydrogen Hamiltonian has extra symmetry that goes beyond the rotational symmetry in three-dimensional space. In fact, it turns out that it's possible to model or to, to make a mathematical representation of the hydrogen atom in a four-dimensional space. This is not space-time, it's just a mathematical space, but it has an extra dimension. And you find that the hydrogen atom Hamiltonian is invariant in the rotations in the full four-dimensional space. These are SO4 rotations. This is, one of the, this, this is what lies behind the extra degeneracy that appears here. I won't lecture on this any further than just to make a mention of that, but if you look at Schiff's book, he has actually has a nice presentation of this SO4 symmetry that's uh, pretty easy to understand and also uh, gives, gives a beginning of, on, on that subject. However, the fact remains that we have this extra degeneracy in hydrogen, so let's calculate what it is. In particular, what is the degeneracy of one of these N levels? The energy depends only on N. So what is it? So the degeneracy, so if we fix the value of n, now, you know, see earlier I said earlier I said if we fix L, that means we're solving a particular radial, radial wave equation that n goes starts at L plus one and goes to infinity. That's like looking at one of these columns and starting from the bottom and running up. But suppose we fix the value of n and ask what L values are allowed. We fix one of these rows and run across. Well, you can see that the that the allowed L value it, it then goes from zero, one, all the way up to n minus one. This is the range on L values for a fixed value of n. For example, in the n equals 2 level, we have L equals 0 and L equals 1. Or 0, 1, and 2 for the n equals 2 levels. So the order of the degeneracy then is the sum of the allowed L values, namely L equals 0 up to n minus 1, of the degeneracy of each L value, which is 2L plus 1. And this sum can be done when the answer is n squared. The degeneracy of the hydrogen levels is a function of n is n squared. For example, for n equals 2, you see you have one level at the 2s plus three levels at the 2p, and the total is 4, which is 2 squared. It's an example of this. All right, this is the extra degeneracy of hydrogen. Um, 
I'll come back to this extra degeneracy in a moment, but I'd like to provide you now with a, a rationale for this rule in the L quantum numbers. Uh, for a fixed value of n, that is to say, for a fixed value of the energy, the angular momentum quantum number has a maximum. It goes from 0 up to a maximum, which is n minus 1. I'd like to show you that something like this occurs also in classical mechanics, and it gives you some classical intuition for what these quantum numbers mean in the case of hydrogen. So allow me to talk the classical mechanics of a Coulomb problem or a Kepler or one over R potential uh, for, for just a moment. Um, so let's say we have classically a potential V of R, which let's write it as minus K over R, where K is some constant. Of course, in our problem, K is the same thing as ZE squared for our atomic problem, but we can apply this to the planets, too. Uh, the orbits, as you know, are ellipses, and I plot them in an xy plane with the force center of the origin. A typical orbit might look like this. The, the, the force center is at the focus. The ellipse is described by two parameters, A and E. A is the semi major axis, so that going from one side of the ellipse to the other is twice the semi major axis. This is going a long way, that's why it's called a semi major axis. Semi minor axis goes the other way. And E is the eccentricity, so A is the semi-major axis. And uh, if E is the eccentricity of the ellipse, and this is in the range, zero is less than or equal to E is less than or equal to one. An eccentricity of zero corresponds to a circle, and an eccentricity of one corresponds to an ellipse that's been smashed so flat it becomes just a straight line orbit. Uh, to give you different cases of this, if we Take the case of eccentricity equals zero, we've got a, a circular orbit like this. Uh, this is D equals zero. If I increase the eccentricity, uh, you get orbits that look something like this. If you increase the eccentricity all the way down to, to its maximum value of one, you get a needle-like orbit that goes back and forth like this. This is D equals one. And this is an eccentricity halfway between. Um, the energy and the angular momentum of the classical orbit uh, are functions of the semi major axis and eccentricity. The energy, in fact, is equal to minus k over twice a. It depends only on the semi major axis and not on the eccentricity. The angular momentum, however, is the square root of mka times 1 minus e squared, so it does depend on the eccentricity. In fact, you can see that L, the angular momentum, has a minimum when the eccentricity is equal to 1, because that makes this equal to 0. If L min is equal to 0, this is the eccentricity of 1. That's this needle-like orbit here. And L is a maximum when the eccentricity is 0. Uh, and in that case, it's just the square root of mka. This is the case of E is equal to 0. Uh, the equal 0 is a circular orbit. So the angular momentum ranging from zero to its maximum is, is, is three orbits that look like this. Now here, I'm, here what I'm doing is I'm, I want to hold the, the, to make it look like a quantum problem, we want to hold the energy fixed and look at the, very, the range of angular momentum. So if we hold the energy fixed, it's the same as holding the semi-major axis fixed. The semi-major axis of the, of the circular orbit is the same as the radius of the circle. And when we squish it out to make an ellipse, we have to keep the semi-major axis the same. That means the diameter of the circle has to be the same thing as the twice the semi-major axis of the ellipse, or even in the case of the needle, has to be the same. So therefore, the needle goes from zero up to twice the radius of the circular orbit. And that's the range on these, these orbits that look like this. And so you see that even in classical mechanics, the angular momentum goes from zero to a maximum depends on the energy. In fact, we write it up more explicitly if I solve the uh, solve this for the semi-major axis in terms of the energy, the L max turns into uh, mk squared divided by minus twice the energy. This is, of course, the negative energy that this applies. And that's your maximum angular momentum. Now, the way this manifests itself in quantum mechanics, uh, the, 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 one of the ways of connecting this classical picture with quantum mechanics, how, how do we connect these different types of orbits for a fixed value of energy? with the wave functions that we'll see in quantum mechanics. Uh, let me take the case of the n equals 3 levels here. So there's a 3s, 3p, and 3e going from minimum 
at s equals zero, that's the needle-like orbits, to the maximum, which is the circular orbits. What do they look like? Well, I'll show you a sketch if you plot them. Uh, if you make a plot of, let's first start with the, uh, let's first start with the needle-like orbit. Let's take the three s. I'll take this absolute value squared, so it's really a probability as a function of radius. Uh, and you plot them, it'll look something like this. There's a bump, there's a first bump, and then there's it goes to zero, and a bigger bump, and then there's a bigger bump, and that's the end of it. That's three bumps like that. There's two nodes if you are to plot two nodes of the function if I plot the function instead of the square. Um, if you plug in the values for the energy and calculate the classical semi-major axis, you'll find it's about halfway in this in this function like this. This is a classical semi-major axis. And in fact, this corresponds to the needle leg orbit right here. Now, if I then plot the next one over, which is the F3P, where L is equal to 1 squared, now the wave function moves in from the origin. It only has two bumps, and the maximum bump is, has now moved in. Both, these, they both, both ends move in, and one bump disappears. So it starts to look like this. And this corresponds to you see, now there's an inner radial turning point, which is not zero. That's why this, that's why this is this first bump is moved outwards. And there's an outer radial turning point that's not as far out, it's moved inwards. That's why this bump is moved inwards. And then finally, if I plot the last one, which is the F3 SPD, this is the maximum angular momentum corresponding to the circular orbit, you get a single bump like this, which is concentrated closely at the uh, at the uh, value of the classical radius. That's the circular orbit. Okay. So it's worthwhile remembering this. The S waves, you see, go all the way down to the origin. Whereas the states of high angular minimum, like circular orbits, stay away from the origin. In fact, they fly off. They have very small values at the origin. I hope you remember that I said that the radial wave function RL of R goes as R to the L power near the origin. And that's part of what you're seeing here. This wave function is lying down ever more flat near the origin as L increases. All right, so that's just some pictures to help with an intuitive understanding of quantum mechanics, of the quantum mechanics of hydrogen. Now, allow me to go back to this question of degeneracy, which is, I explained, this extra degeneracy that goes beyond rotational invariance, which is manifested in this diagram by these, these energy levels being the same as they move across angular momentum values. This is a special property of the Coulomb potential. And uh, if we take a, a, make a perturbation of the Coulomb potential, even while making it a, 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 rate, a, 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 a central force problem, remaining in the, in the framework of central force problems, Let's make some perturbations on this and see what happens. You'll see what happens is, is that the energy levels for different L's for a given end move up and down. In other words, it breaks the degeneracy. I'll show you a couple of physically interesting ways in which uh, that may take place. One of these is uh, called the volume effect. Uh, the volume effect. And, and by the way, as I say, this will be still we'll still be talking about central force potentials. I won't change the there will still be rotationally invariant potentials. Here's the physics of the volume effect. It has to do with the fact that the proton, in the case of hydrogen, or the nucleus for higher hydrogen-like atoms, is not really a point charge. Uh, the proton is a composite particle and has an internal structure. And when you have heavier nuclei, they're made up of protons and neutrons. And so the Coulomb potential, minus, minus z d squared over r, is actually not valid once you get to a radius that puts you inside the nucleus. So allow me to make a plot here uh, of potentials of V as a function of radius. And let me just, this is very schematic. Let's, let's draw on a dotted line here for, let's say, R equals capital R, which is the nuclear radius. Now, the Coulomb potential does this kind of thing. Of course, it's going down like this. But when you come inside the nuclear radius, then you see it not a point charge, but a charge distribution. And it will round this potential out and it will do something like that. <coughs> so compared to the Coulomb potential, there's, this can be regarded as a perturbation, which is the difference between the, 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 the Coulomb potential valid everywhere and the actual one, which smooths out. The true potential is not as negative as the Coulomb potential when you get the small radii. Now, 
given the fact that it's the S waves or the zero angular momentum waves are the wave functions which are which are most uh, which are largest near the origin. Remember the greater wave function, the R R one S the R S the S wave the R L for, for L equals zero. The radial wave function is, is a constant here and then it gradually dies out. And whereas the L equals one looks like this, and so on. Uh, the, it's the S waves or L equals zero waves that have the largest uh, the largest values near the origin. The size of the nucleus in the case of hydrogen is very small compared to the size of the atoms, a factor of 10 to the fifth. And as a result, um, the perturbation which is produced by this effect is, is really very tiny in the case of hydrogen, almost always negligible. But for heavier atoms, it becomes more important because the wave functions shrink towards the, or pulled in tighter towards the nucleus, and also the nucleus grows in size. And so for heavier atoms, the volume effect actually does become important. To go off on a slight little tangent, let me say something about the nuclear size and give you a basic fact of nuclear physics. In nuclear physics, of course, the nuclei are made out of uh, neutrons and protons. Uh, Z is the uh, usual symbol for the number of protons. And, uh, and N is the symbol for the number of neutrons, what they usually do in uh, nuclear physics. And A is defined as the sum of two of the number of nucleons, A plus C. Uh, the basic fact that I want to mention is, is that the radius of the nucleus uh, goes as A to the one third power. And this is because the nucleons uh, interact with one another by only a short range interaction. They more or less have to be touching. And uh, if you try to push them too close together, there's a strong repulsion from the Pauli principle. And the result is that they behave like little hard, hard balls, hard spheres. And uh, that's why the radius goes as A to the one third. This is quite different in the case of atoms. Atoms, the radius of the atom does not grow as Z to the one third. It has a relative dependence. In any case, um, this is basically just counts for the volume occupied by the nucleus. nucleus. But, as you see, if you go to uranium, where A is 230, uh, 238, uh, the, the nucleus is bigger and the wave function is smaller. Anyway, the volume effect becomes more important for heavier atoms. But the point that, that to go back to the point I want to make about breaking the degeneracy, you can see that the S waves, the L equals zero, the volume effect is going to be most important for those, and in fact, it tends to be negligible for all the others. So what it'll do is it'll take, for example, this 2S level and raise it, it raises it because the potential is not as negative as the calculation is using. And in particular, it introduces a splitting between the 2s and the 2p. So that's one example of a physical effect which breaks this, this uh, special degeneracy which holds the hydrogen. Let me show you another example uh, of a physical effect that does the same thing, in this case more dramatically. Uh, this has to do with the alkali atoms. Uh, the alkali atoms, of course, are starting with lithium, there's sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, if you want to deal with a radioactive element. Those are the six. Uh, the alkali atoms are characterized by having a single electron outside a core composed of a closed uh, subshells. It's really a multi-electron problem, and these are not simple to analyze in detail, but there's a crude model of the alkali atoms that's oftentimes useful, and that is to imagine that you've got a core which is rotationally symmetric, uh, and it's made of the inner core electrons which produce some density. Some density rho is a function of, of the radius r, assume it's rotationally invariant. And then out here, there's a single electron, which is the valence electron, moving in this, in this central force potential. Well, this row of R is the density of the inner core electrons. So if we integrate this zero to infinity, uh, four pi R squared dr times row of R, that's the total amount of charge contained in the core. It's going to be it's going to be z minus one uh, times times e with no row minus sign because there are electrons producing this. Of course, the nucleus has a charge of has a charge of plus z. And so if you're well outside the core, this, this valence electron is going to see the same electric field that it would in the case of hydrogen, just a single charge. However, if the electron penetrates into the core, which it will do in the case of the S waves, which go all the way down to the origin, remember these the high angular momentum are like the circular orbits. 
So for high angular momentum, this electron is going to be moving out here in circular orbit and it won't really see the core very much. But for lower angular momentum, it will, it will penetrate in. And as it does, there's less and less streaming of the core. In fact, it may come for S waves, it'll go, it'll come all the way down to the nucleus and see the full unscreened charge of the nucleus, which is plus Z E. So this is a rather dramatic breaking of the Coulomb potential. It's only the Coulomb potential outside of the core. Uh, giving an example of the effect of this, let's talk about the spectrum of sodium. Uh, and uh, here I'll do this again in one of these diagrams where we have SPDF for angular momentum going like this. The ground state of sodium is at a 3s level. It's at n equals 3, l equals 0 level. It's not a 1s as in hydrogen because the 1s and in fact the 2s and 2p levels are what make up the core. And the valence electron has to go to a different state, so it has to go into the 3s. But, it's, but, it's, but in comparison to hydrogen, the 3s level is right up there. You see that's where it is. And it's degenerate with 3p and 3d. Well, in sodium, it's quite different. The 3p, 3d level is up higher and the 3d level is up higher like this. And in fact, the splitting is not small. The difference in energies between the 3s and the 3p is an optical transition. This is the yellow sodium D line, which is, which is what makes fires yellow. It's the very bright uh, line in, in the, from the sodium spectrum. So it's in the, so this, is a, this is measured in several electron volts, this energy difference here. Uh, it's also easy to see why the energies increase with increasing angular momentum. Because as the angular momentum increases, the orbits become more and more circular. And so this valence electron is seeing less and less of the core. It's the S waves that penetrate down to where the core is, and they see the full unscreened charge of the nucleus, so they're pulled in more tightly. And so therefore, they're more, they're more tightly bound and they have a lower energy. This is exactly what's going on in, in, these, uh, in these energy levels like this. So, all right. So those are two physically interesting ways of, of, um, of uh, breaking the special degeneracy which holds in the case of hydrogen. Now this model of hydrogen that I've been talking about so far is what I would call the electrostatic spinless model of hydrogen. It's electrostatic because uh, the Coulomb potential is based on Coulomb's law, which of course is electrostatics. Uh, we know that electrostatics is only an approximation to full electromagnetic phenomena. Uh, we know that in the case of uh, hydrogen, there will be uh, electromagnetic phenomena. There's going to be effects of retardation, relativistic effects that the electron has some velocity. Uh, and in addition, there are magnetic effects coming from mo moving charges. Uh, the spin of the electron interacts in particular, the spin of the electron interacts with, mag with magnetic fields. And the result is that when we include the electron spin in the degrees of freedom description of the hydrogen, uh, there, are, there are effects that couple together the orbital and spin degrees of freedom, giving rise to what's called the fine structure of hydrogen. These can be regarded overall as relativistic effects, or maybe better you could think of them as spin plus relativistic effects, although in a sense spin it is, it is by itself a relativistic effect. So uh, we'll go into that next time and uh, talk about how we include spin and in particular the problem of addition of angular momentum. So that's all. Let me remind you, if anybody wants to borrow